Okay. So uh, welcome back after a month of uh, time zone changes and you know and the the multiple things that we had to do you know to to get used to this uh, uh, daylight savings. Uh, so this uh, chapter, which is the last chapter, uh, the authors uh, uh, give us uh, some introduction about what I've been doing in the previous chapters, right? From, you know, one through 11 mainly, uh, just setting aside the uni uh, unsupervised learning, which has its own, you know, its own uh, techniques and rules on unlabeled data. But from 1 to 11, what we have been doing is uh, uh, using the statistical uh, foundations in data science to uh, draw some uh, predictions, right? Estimation. So in this chapter, which is the only one in the book that is you know, fo focused on the other statistical area of inference, all right? So when we talk about inference, what we're talking is about getting a sample right from a, from a unknown uh, population and from the sample get some uh, statistics that will infer what is the composition of that other unknown population uh, a, 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 you know a very typical example of this is for example uh, surveys okay if you want to survey, what is the, uh, you know, what is the preference of customers on different products that you are, you know, you are trying to assess? Uh, it will be almost impossible to ask every customer of of that pro of that particular product, you know, how do they feel about the product, right? So what you do is just take a sample that would should be representative of that unknown number of customers, and then you draw some inferences about the composition of that population. Uh, we're not going to get into detail about the sampling by itself, because, you know, in the sampling, you should be aware, depending on what you are, you know, what you're studying, uh, you should be aware of certain biases, right? Uh, for example, you know, uh, demographics, you know, the age of the, of the customer, uh, the ethnicity of the customer, the locations, and so forth. What I'm going to talk about that. What I'm going to talk about is how to draw a, a hypothesis, a hypothesis testing, and you should be, you know, you should be uh, aware of some of the uh, procedures, uh, steps that we do with uh, making a, a hypothesis testing, and. Uh, try to see the challenge that the authors bring in terms of what is called multiple testing. Okay, when we talk about multiple testing, is that from that sample that we gather from a population, in the sample, we're going to do several, several tests, right? Uh, for example, we can do uh, correlations. We can do uh, t-tests. Okay, one sample t-test, two sample t-test, so forth. We can do ANOVA. Uh, if the, the, the sample is uh, categorical, for example, in, you know, that they're labels, in terms of numeric, we could do kind of a chi-square, chi all right, a test, a contingency uh, test to see if there is a difference between, you know, the composition distribution of those labels. So we can do a lot of tests, and what happens is that with every test that you incorporate, you're affecting the threshold, the threshold that you're going to 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 to, to use if you are going to uh, reject what is called your null hypothesis or not reject because there's not enough information to do that rejection. Okay, and we're going to talk a little bit about you know, what are the steps, you know, so that we can refresh. But basically, this is the uh, the main topic of this chapter. Yeah, that's what is called multiple multiple testing. We're doing different tests on the same 
uh, sample data. Uh, we're going to talk about also of what is called type one errors, okay, which associated with the false positives. Uh, type two errors, which are associated with the false negatives. We're going to talk about family wise error rate. We're going to talk about false discovery rate and a little bit of something that is called power. Okay, the power of uh, rejecting uh, type two error. All right. And of course, you know, because we're kind of doing when we do this multiple tests, we're kind of doing kind of a resampling of the of the sample data also to, you know, uh, do the calculations for the p-values, all right? Okay, so what, what is a hypothesis test? And, you know, I, I always want the audience, you know, to, to participate. So when, when we talk about hypothesis testing, what does it come, what, what, what comes to mind? Uh, validating uh -huh. if something is true or not. Right, right. If something is true or not, right? Uh, okay, good, good. Uh, uh, Lydia. I'm going to cheat and say inference. <laughs> uh -huh, inference, okay. Yeah, that, that, that's true. You know, that's part of the of, of the steps, you know, the scientific steps that we uh, we use to make to make an inference, right? So yeah, yeah, that, that that's part of it. So uh, you know, back when you, we were in, let's say we were in uh, mid school, right? You know, like at the seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, you know, all those uh, fun years. <laughs> um, we started, you know, people in the science class started to talk about hypotheses, right? And what you do is that you state. As something that you want to test, right? So, for example, let's let's take a simple example. Uh, let's take a flip of a of a coin. Let's take a coin first, whichever coin you know. Picture in your mind, whichever coin. And we want to test if that if when you flip that coin is going to go or what is called heads, right? Heads or tails. So we want to test is, is if that coin is, is a fair coin, okay? In other words, it's unbiased. In other words, it doesn't go one way or the other. So it just stays within a channel of probability that will give you, you know, 50% heads or 50% uh, tails. So the way that you would you know, state your hypothesis is that you have to start with something that is basic. In other words, the 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 the, uh, the, the acknowledgement that there is some uh, truth in you know in in that statement. So we can say, for example, that our statement is that the coin is fair, or or the coin is unbiased. Okay, that's what we expect uh, from any coin that we use to uh, flip and you know get 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 a get a result. So that's going to be our what is called the null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis is kind of the expectation, the expectation of what we think it should happen at least you know in the in in the real world. Okay, let's take then. What is the altern the alternate hypothesis in this case? In this case, well, the alternate hypothesis in this case will be that the coin is not fair, right? So it has some bias. That the that's that's the alternate hypothesis. But because we don't know that, we have to do several uh, tries, right? It doesn't it doesn't uh, it, it it won't be a very wise to say, okay, I'm going to flip it two times, okay? In those two times, depending on the results, I'm going to draw my conclusions. I don't think, you know, uh, we, should, we should be doing that, right? We're going to flip it as many times as possible to make a, you know, uh, a, a statistical significant 
uh, formulation. Okay, so let's say that we flip that coin a thousand times, right? Could be a thousand, ten thousand. You know, just pick a number that makes sense to you, and you know it will give you a kind of a, a peace of mind. You know, after after the, the the inference. So what happens is that let's say the thousand times, let's say that we get. I'm going to just put a number there. Uh, we get five hundred and fifteen heads, right? And if we subtract the 1,000 by the 515, we get the tails. So it should be something around 485, right? If I'm if I not, if, 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 if my math is good. Okay, so we have a little bit more heads than uh, tails. So how do we know, how do we know that that coin is fair? How can we draw a conclusion from that, you know, a test that we did? Well, you're going to have a distribution, right? Of the normal parameters of a fair, fair base coin, right? So what are you going to do is that you're going to say, okay, I have a point that it goes to the heads, you know, a little bit, you know, our, our expectation was that it was 50-50, 500 heads, 500 tails. That's going to be our, our expected, uh, uh, you know, probability, which is basically the mean of that distribution. So, because it's 515, it went 15 more than our expected. But is that enough to reject our null hypothesis in favor of the alternate? What, what do you think? Could you repeat uh, the, the last number? Mm -hmm. Okay, we did a simulation of 1,000 uh, coin flips. Coin flips. And the result was that in those 1,000, 515, okay? 515 were heads and the rest were tails. Uh, you know, you subtract 1,000 by 515, you get 485, right? So you got a little bit more heads than tails of what you expected to happen. If the coin is fair, you expect that you're going to get 500 heads and 500 tails, correct? Yeah, but do we have 1,000 coins or one coin that is getting to 1,000 times? It, it, it's the flips, the flips. You're uh, I, the coin. So only one coin? It's only one coin, yeah. Okay. You're, you're using the same coin, always okay. with the flip. Yeah, you're not using 1,000 coins, only one coin. You're repeating, you're repeating the flip. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we got that 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 figure, 515, 485, it deviates a little bit, right? From what we expect a fair coin should do. But the question is, is that deviation enough? Enough to reject our belief that the uh, coin is fair. In other words, unbiased. I would believe that it is not enough, but I'm I'm not sure. Right. Uh we could we you know it is something in our instinct says that you know I, you know it, I know I acknowledge the deviation, but it, it's not enough, okay, to reject what I believe should be the standard that the coin is fair. All right. So in that example. What we're doing is trying to, you know, picture in, in, in your minds what would be the result that will tell us, okay, something here is not right. In other words, that coin is not behaving like a fair coin. So, for example, if we get, for example, 900 heads, now we're going a little bit extreme, 900 heads and 100 tails. Would you would your conclusion change now? Yeah. Uh, Lucio says yes. What about you, Lily? Sorry, I looked away for a moment. What was the question? <laughs> you have to be present. You have to be present. <laughs> okay, so we, we did that. The first experiment that we did with that coin was five five fifteen 
and 485. 515 heads, 485. And Lucio said, uh, it's not enough, you know, to say that that coin is fishy. You know, it, 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 that, 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 is, that is unbiased, okay? But now I change a little bit the, the situation. And now we have, let's say that we have another coin, another coin that the results were 900 heads and 100 tails. Okay, and a nine to one ratio here. Uh, what do you what would you say about that coin? Does that coin is fair or not? No, it doesn't seem fair. <laughs> doesn't seem fair, right? Uh, so right now what we're saying is that somewhere, somewhere in the threshold of nine to one, <laughs> you know, nine heads, one tails, in that threshold, we will say that hey, you know, that coin is not behaving the way that the 515 and 485, you know, will, will do it, all right? So one of the things that in these experiments that, that we do is that we have to define a threshold, okay? So in that threshold, if we achieve that threshold, that means that the null hypothesis uh, is going to be rejected. In other words, it deviates so much of, of the norm that we are compelled, you know, by statistical uh, significance, we are compelled to uh, reject the null hypothesis and you know uh, reject that in favor. Uh, in in the statistical parlance, we never say accept <laughs> the the hypothesis because there's always a, a wiggle room, a wiggle room of probability that we could be making a mistake in terms of rejecting the null hypothesis or uh, you know rejecting it as, uh, in favor of the the alternate hypothesis in other words we don't accept you know anything here okay so any questions so far about what where we're going not really we're good yeah okay so what i described is basically this section 3.2 about the hypothesis testing steps but i wanted to do it in kind of a, a, a thought experiment so we could understand you know, what's happening. So we said that we, we define a hypothesis and usually that hypothesis, which is going to be our null hypothesis, is going to be something that we expect, right? You know, the, a, a coin is fair, a dice is fair. If we have a control and a treatment group, you know, on a, let's say on a clinical trial that we're testing a new drug, what we expect, what we expect is that both groups, there's not going to be, the drug is not going to have a substantial effect in the treatment group vis-a-vis -vis the control group. That's what we expect, okay? So we need more proof, right, to make sure that that drug is, you know, behaving the way it should behave and is departing from that control group, okay? Uh, one thing that I have... Uh, I mean, this is the last chapter of, of this book. And I was thinking, but why did the authors didn't talk about what is called non-parametric uh, tests? Uh, are, are you aware of, of, of that term, non-parametric tests? I'm not. No? Okay. Okay. Let, 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 let me go back there. Okay. So you see in this book, okay, and basically it's because, uh, because the authors are bringing it for the first day, for the first time, maybe they want to, you know, um, make it as simple as possible. But when we talk about, let's say, a T statistic, we talk about ANOVA. Um, we talk about uh, the test on the on a linear regression with the assumptions. What we're talking about is that we are assuming that our distribution of the population from where the sample is taking. The distribution is Gaussian. In other words, it's normal. All right. So, for example, what what does the the normal of Gaussian distribution means to our you know to our uh, problem? It means that the values of the mean, the mode, and the median are aligned. In other words, they are the same, right? If you see a bell curve, and you calculate the mean, that's going to be also the median and also the mode. So it makes it easier right, to work with that kind of distribution to get the statistics. Okay, 
But we know that the world that we live in sometimes doesn't behave that way. Okay, for example, let's take the sample of the salary of, of a group. Uh, the salaries usually don't, uh, don't behave like a Gaussian normal distribution because you have extremes. You have low salaries, very high salaries, and something in the middle. Okay, so that's why uh, there's some non-parametric uh, tests that instead of using the mean as the basis of the of the you know of the study, it uses the median, okay, which is the middle value when the values are ranked in order, right? And it's more robust, more robust to our lives. But the authors don't talk about that, so let's try to you know make sure that we know that there's some other distributions out there. But the, their analysis is based always on the normal, the Gaussian distribution. All right? So uh, we define the, the hypothesis. When we define the hypothesis, also we can define the alternate hypothesis also. And it's good to you know, have that, that, that thinking. Then once we define the hypothesis, we have to select the test that we're going to use. So for example, if the variable is numeric, usually when you are dealing with one sample test or two sample tests, you are uh, testing the mean, the mean of that, this, that sample, trying to see if it gives you some information about the population mean. So in this case, we're going to do what is called a t-statistic, right? And the t-statistic, which comes from what is called a student's uh, t-distribution, uh, it has the advantage that it works for small samples, samples, let's say, less than 30, and greater samples more than 30. Why? Because after 30, uh, you know, 30 observations in a sample, the student's t-distribution behaves like a Gaussian distribution. So you have the, 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 the best of two worlds. You have a distribution that works very well for small samples and also for large, large samples. Okay? Then, once you know the test, you're going to calculate that statistic from that test, and then you're going to compare it, contempt, compare with what is called a threshold. In other words, if that value is less than this value, okay, what is called alpha, which is associated with a type one error, and we're going to see what a type one error is, that alpha is going to be your guide to say, okay, if that value is greater than, than alpha, we don't reject the null hypothesis. In other words, we don't have any uh, major evidence to reject that null hypothesis. But if we go beyond alpha, right? You know, it's, it's less, less than, than alpha, then uh, we reject. And that value, okay? That value uh, that we're testing, which is the threshold is alpha, is what we call the p-value, the p-value, which is the probability of that piece, you know, of area under the curve that is beyond that statistic, all right? So far, so good? I didn't quite get uh, how did the formulas for T and S came up. Uh, yeah, th th these are th these are formulas that you can derive them. Uh, the the author uh, the authors doesn't go in detail, but you can derive them because of the parameters of the you know of, of the distribution. Okay, like you can derive uh, the parameters or the mean from the Gaussian distribution. In this case, because we are doing a t test, the distribution that we're using is a stud student's t distribution, and you can get. Uh, you know, uh, if, if if you go in detail, you can uh, develop this. You know, through you know different assumptions, okay. And and the, the the author gives you the formulas for calculating the t, okay, the t statistic, and also for calculating the standard deviation. All right. So, so we are assuming that uh, that right hand side of the t equality that does. Has a T student distribution? 
let me see. Okay, uh, it don't, it don't, it doesn't mention it, but the you know if if you look at the T, this uh, where T uh, statistic. Okay, when you look at the definition, uh, it will it will give you it is used in hypothesis testing via students T test. Okay, which is the students uh, T distribution. Okay, uh, the authors don't don't give you that information because I guess they are assuming. that you know what it means, <laughs> all right? Uh, but yeah, but I, I, I try to be a little bit more, you know, uh, explanatory here, okay? In other words, this is not your standard normal distribution, okay? Because as, as you can see, you know, if you study that student distribution, uh, the normal or Gaussian distribution, the only parameters that define them is the mean, the mu, and the, and the variance, okay? Which is the standard deviation uh, to the square. Those are the two parameters that define a Gaussian or normal distribution. In the student, the student's t distribution is defined by the degrees of freedom. Okay, which is something that is not, uh, you know, contemplated in the you know Gaussian or normal distribution. Okay. Good. Okay, so uh, this is an experiment where we are. Uh, studying if from two groups that we have, you know, this is the two sample tests, from two groups we are uh, testing what, what is called the mean, the mean of each group, right? So there you see that the age uh, not, right? The age with the zero, you know, as a, as a subscript, it means that that is the null hypothesis, and the null hypothesis is that the mean of those of those groups is equal. You know, there's no significant difference between the mean of those uh, two groups, right? The alternate, which is going to be age subscribe subscript A, is going to be that there's a difference, right? You know, you can put a little, you know, a little dash there, there on a dash there, and say that there's a difference between those two groups. But as we also uh, uh, contemplated in that experiment of the flip of the coins, where is that we can tell that, you know, the our null hypothesis should be rejected? Where does it have to, that t statistic has to land in order to reject that uh, null hypothesis? Well, one of the uh, examples that the authors gave you is that, you know, using that distribution, let's say that you got a T of what is called a T statistic of 2.333, uh, all right? So in that case, you're going to compute this area, this area that is, you know, the one, you know, uh, to, the, to the right of that tail, and it's going to give you a number. That is going to be the p-value. In other words, it's the probability of that number being that number or greater in that distribution, okay? And it's, and it's uh, you know, a, a, it's calculated by the area to the right, Bella, to the right, you know, the greater of, you know, that, that t t statistic, that number, 2.33. And what happens is that when you calculate it, you get a number, you know, from this distribution, number of 0 0.02. In other words, 0 0.02 probability that that number is uh, inside that particular uh, distribution. If you have a threshold of, of alpha of 0 0.05, that means that that p-value is going to be less than 0 0.05 and you have to reject your null hypothesis, okay? If the number was, let's say one here, okay? It was right here, one. And one, when you calculate the area, gives you 0.4. Let's put, let's put it, you know, uh, uh, hypothetically, 0.4. So that means that 0.4 is greater than your alpha, than your threshold, you know, to decide, you know, if you're going to reject or not. So that means that that particular number has a 40%, you know, probability to be included in the distribution. And because of that, then you cannot reject because your Uh, p-value is greater than your 
uh, threshold, your alpha. And you have seen this. When we talk about the, remember the linear regression, uh, you know, chapter three, uh, we talk about the confidence of intervals of the estimates of the predictors, okay, and the p-value. So what it says is that if that number, the p-value is greater than, you know, is less than 0.05, that means that that coefficient is not significant. You know, we're doing a t-test right there, you know, with that coefficient. And what happens is that that coefficient could be, if it's not significant, it could be zero. In other words, it's, it's not significant. And it's the same, the same, the same process. Okay. Good for now? Yes, good. very good. Good, okay. So now uh, the authors uh, present us kind of uh, a, a, a follow-up, right? You know, we're going to follow this technique and we're going to say, for example, that we could be right, right? We could be right uh, sometimes, sometimes when we reject that uh, null hypothesis, but sometimes we could be wrong. Right. So in this matrix, which is kind of a confusion matrix, remembering classification that we work about confusion matrix, uh, the same idea here. So you, you have here the truth, which comes from the population, and then you have your, uh, you know, your decision that you're going to make using the sample. So in this case, when, when the truth is, that the that the null hypothesis shouldn't be rejected, which is the correct place. Sometimes there are going to be samplings that are going to tell you otherwise. In other words, that you have to reject that null hypothesis. If the null hypothesis should have not been rejected and you reject it, that's what is called a type one error. So going back to this example, if we calculate, let's say, and, and now uh, we say an alpha of 0 0.05, and we get a p-value of 0 0.0495, 495, very close to that you know, uh, threshold. And we're going to reject it, right? But there is a chance that that sampling uh, is not indicative of rejecting that null hypothesis, all right? So we're... Uh, committing in that case, we're committing a type one error. Um, when I, you know, I was involved in uh, 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 teaching uh, criminal justice uh, uh, courses, one of the things that I always remember is that when you are in a criminal case, uh, what the standard of convicting, you know, a, a, a defendant, uh, you know, the person at charge. With, with a crime, the standard is that uh, you know that there's no no significant doubt you know for the jury or the judge to convict that person. So what do it, that does what does it mean that if you have some doubt of the evidence that was presented to convict that person, that means that then you should not convict if you have you know a reasonable doubt. What is called a reasonable doubt beyond reasonable doubt. I don't know if, you know, at least in the U.S., that's the standard. I don't know if, you know, other countries, that's the standard, but let's stay with the U.S. So the threshold there is the highest of any, you know, uh, uh, you know law case in the U.S., the criminal case, because the consequences are, are severe. Uh, you could lose your life. You could lose, uh, you know, your freedom, property, all that. So seeing that, you know, that norm, you know, in, in what is called a type one error and type two error, what happens when even though the evidence was not convincing, or, or, or all the evidence was not convincing, that the judge or the jury convinced, uh, or convicted uh, the person. So they could be doing a type one error. In other words, the person is innocent, but then, you know, you, uh, you stated that the person is guilty when in fact the person is innocent because that's the standard you know the the h h not the null hypothesis that's the that that that's that's the expectation 
that the person that is charged is innocent until uh, you know proof otherwise, right? So in the type two error is the opposite, right? We rejected the null hypothesis in favor of the uh, uh, you know of the alternate hypothesis, but then we we know from the truth we know that the 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 the, the decision that we made was to not reject the null hypothesis. Okay, not reject uh, alternate hypothesis, and that will be the type error. So the type two error in this case of the criminal case is going to be the reverse. The person that is charged did the crime, did the crime, but because we couldn't prove enough, you know, get enough evidence to clear that reasonable doubt threshold, then that person goes free. So my question is, there is type one error or type two error in all the decisions that we make when we're doing hypothesis uh, testing. Which one would you minimize more, the type one error or the type two error? I think it depends. I can't recall the exact meme, but there's mm -hmm. like, yeah, it can depend. Um, Cause like, the chance of telling someone they have cancer when they don't versus right. telling someone they uh, they don't have cancer when they do. Um, like in that instance, either way it's bad, but potentially someone, Correct. if they actually do have cancer and you tell them the wrong thing there and then they pass away without having had the chance to take, um to have treatment. But also in the other case, it's like you tell someone they have cancer and then they go through all the uh -huh. all the signs of grieving and maybe um spend all their money or what else they do chemo, either way it has they go, yeah. they go through chemo and all that yeah, yeah. chemo and it, yeah either has consequences so it really depends it really will depend um yeah but talking about that criminal case setting for example you know which is kind of you know at least in my in my view is is it's clear because it is yeah. true what you're saying. Uh, yeah. It depends. It depends. Oh, on I want to tell you a couple of things. You know why it depends. Yeah. So, for example, in the criminal case, what is the outcome that we should not do? Okay. The the outcome that we should avoid. Putting uh, innocent putting, person put, putting, in jail. putting innocent persons in jail or freeing guilty persons? I think putting an innocent person in jail. Right. I, I think so, too. I think so, too. What about you, Lucy? Uh, I, I thought it was type two, and now I feel morally wrong. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, for example, the type one person, type one error, sorry, the type one error is the one that we are rejecting what we expect and and and, that, and that's a, that's a big, big issue okay because even though our testing and and we have to be careful about you know how we do our testing if our testing is telling us to reject that hypothesis when in fact is the hypothesis that explains you know the behavior of the population we're committing a type 1 error in the other one like i said you know uh putting uh you know freeing the the guilty person even though you know we we the truth is that that person is committed the crime, all right? Uh, that that would be a type two error, and that one should be avoided. You know, uh, that one should be avoided at, at, at all costs. Okay, but as Lydia says, it depends. It depends. For example, when we are dealing with fraud, uh, fraudulent transactions, uh, for let's say for credit cards, credit cards. Okay, so in this context. The type one error when we classify a transaction as fraudulent is that that transaction is legit, but we are classifying it as fraudulent because the classification algorithm it's, it's telling us to you know to go that way. Okay, that will be a type one error. The type two error will be that the program the algorithm says no that transaction is legit uh uh it's fraudulent. <laughs> okay. 
So there is a cost for the organization that is managing that credit, those credit card transactions. There is a cost that is very different from managing a transaction that is le that is legit and is fraudulent than the fraudulent and is, and is legit. Okay, and you have to take consideration that to try to see where you want to balance in terms of the cost of those two type errors. Okay, because as it says here. There's always a trade-off between type one error and type two. In other words, you're not going to eliminate it uh, completely. Okay, there's going to be a chance, a probability that those errors are going to occur, no matter you know what kind of you know algorithm or uh, <laughs> LLM uh, you're using. Okay, so we're good. We're good here. We're good here. Yep. Yep. Okay, so now we start talking about that, you know, what the authors are, are bringing to the table, which is the multiple testings. So, for example, remember the flip of a coin, right? We cannot assess if the coin is fair or not just by one flip. You have to do it multiple times, okay? And that's related to what is called the power. The power of, you know, of, 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 the, of the sample you know, as much as the sample is larger and it approximates the population, the better, you know, statistics inference you can do. All right, you know, that's, you know, part of the, of the, the, the practice. So what happens is that when you uh, do multiple testings on the, same, uh, on the same sample, and I found this, uh, uh, this video that it kind of explain a little bit better, you know, more, more than the book. Okay. Uh, when, when we're talking about family wise error rate, this is what we're talking about. Usually you have an alpha, which is the threshold, you know, is the, is the mark that is going to say, okay, if our P value is greater than alpha, we don't reject the no hypothesis. If it's greater than alpha, we reject in favor of the null. And usually, but in the book, you will see that in the, in, in the chapter, you will see that in general, a 0 0.05 is the tradition, is the rule of thumb uh, threshold, you know, for, uh, as, uh, you know, rejecting your null hypothesis. But in some instances, you can have stringer, stringent alpha. And it puts a, 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 an example uh, of, of a domain where, Practically, the alpha is ten to the to the minus ninth. Uh, you know, a, a lot of zeros and and one. You know, after that decimal point. So, the alpha, what it says, is corresponds to the maximum level of chance one is willing to accept with respect to rejecting the null hypothesis erroneously. Okay. In other words, we don't want to reject the null hypothesis if we don't have enough evidence to do it. And that's why that alpha has to be a small number, all right? So what happens? And, and we already discussed this. When a researcher re rejects the null hypothesis, when he should, in other words, that the null hypothesis was what the, the truth, you know, uh, the ground truth, then we say that we committed a type one error. But what happens? When we do multiple testings on the same sample of data, and this is very important, this only applies to this particular, you know, a situation when we're doing multiple analysis on the same, on the same sample of data. If you have different samples of data, this doesn't apply. Okay, so that's why when we do the machine learning uh, sampling, what what do we do? We do what is called the cross validation, right? We do a cross validation where we take a chunk of you know, that data set, but then we take another chunk of data. In other words, we don't want to, to, to sample the same, the same data twice. We're going to, you know, mix it there. And that ameliorates this problem that I'm going to present to you. You know, the, 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 the technique of cross-validation. So what happens is that when we do multiple testings, multiple analysis of the same uh, sample of data, Mathematica, mathematically, you can, you know, uh, uh, you can prove 
that your chances of committing only one type one error increases. Increases by the times of the, the analysis. That is called the, the is called with the letter, you know, the low, lowercase m in this case. So what happens? If you do multiple analysis and you have one analysis that is telling you to reject, the family's er, 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 family wise error rate is going to, you know, is going to kick in and it's going to say, okay, yeah, uh, you have to reject. Uh, meanwhile, probably that uh, sample is not telling you that you should re reject the no hypothesis. Okay, that's basically what type of one error is. So the chances of committing one or more type one errors across a collection of statistical analysis performed on the same sample of data is known as the family-wise error rate. So let's say, let's take an example, okay? Let's take an example, and this is how you calculate that, that error rate. Uh, that's, the, that's the formula, and it's the same in, in, the, in the book, only with different numbers. Uh, I, I believe that the C, the, the lowercase, lowercase C here, which is the exponent, is uh, lowercase m. But what you have is an alpha, which is the family-wise error rate, which is equal to one minus, uh, parenthesis, one minus each of the alpha uh, samples, uh, analysis that you are doing uh, to the power of how many have you done. So let's say that you have three statistical tests, tests on the same sample data, and you have a 0 0.05, right? Alpha 0 0.05, very standard. So what would be your family-wise uh, uh, error rate? Well, your family-wise error rate, if you plug those numbers, it will tell you that the alpha is going to be 0 0.05, which is right here, right? The three is going to come from the three statistical tests. You do the math, and then your family-wise uh, error rate is going to be 0 0.4, 0 0.143. In other words, it's not going to be 0 0.05 anymore. It's going to be 0 0.43, and now you have more chances to reject that null hypothesis. And that is a particular problem, you know, in the multiple uh, testing area. Okay. Uh, any questions so far here? No, not the moment. Okay. Not yet. Okay, good. So now that we know what is the family-wise uh, error, which is also explained, you know, with the confusion matrix, et cetera, but basically the formula, this formula is the same, right? So the issue is how to control that a family wise error rate. In other words, try to control that it doesn't ex expand or inflates in that manner. It reminds me of the problem with the multicollinearity that, you know, you have to attend that because that warps the you know the assumptions of of the of the of the of the linear multiple linear regression so the the most common method to try to control that increase of that rate is called the von ferroni correction okay and that's that's the formula what we do is that we divide the alpha our original alpha let's say 0 0.05 divided by the number of statistical tests that you're going to use. In the, in the case that I presented to you, where we have an alpha of 0 0.05, and we have, we're going to do three statistical analysis on the same sample of data. The alpha will be 0 0.05 and the n will be three. So you're going to, then your new corrected uh, family-wise error rate is going to be 0 0.03 divided by three. And that's going to give you, I believe, I'm going to do it right now, 0 0.05 divided by three is going to be 0 0.01, uh, then let's round it to seven, okay? 0 0.017. And that's going to be your new alpha. So if an experiment that you're doing, your analysis, is greater than that new uh, corrected F uh, WER, uh, you, don't, you don't reject. In other words, you stay with your null hypothesis. If one of the samples then goes, uh, uh, you know, uh, less that that new uh, family-wise uh, error rate is corrected, then uh, you can reject your uh, new hypothesis. Um, we only have five minutes, so let me show you. Uh, you can see more clearly that uh, that experiment. 
uh, with this chart, okay, which is uh, taken from the fun uh, data set. Uh, the fund data set is an experiment that it was done with 2,000 uh, 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 hedge fund uh, managers within the span of 50, 50 months, okay? And the, the numbers that they were gathering is, uh, you know, the, 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 the excess returns from, you know, a, a baseline, you know, of the, of the portfolio that they, they are managing. And in this table, uh, there are 2,000 there, but only we get the first five. And in the first five, you get the mean, right? Or the sample, right? The mean, you get a standard deviation, you get a statistic, that it is statistics, and also you get a p-value. If we were doing this analysis uh, independent of each other, you will see that, the, that this p-value, only two managers, two managers, uh, we have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis that no matter which is the manager, you're going to get, you know, the same, the same results. That's basically the null hypothesis here. That, you know, no, no matter which, no matter what is the, who is the hedge fund manager, you're going to get uh, similar, similar results, okay? In this case, only one or three are below that alpha. But what happens? This is a one total set, right? You know, total sample. So we're doing this, uh, this statistic is being done uh, multiple times. So it qualifies for uh, the correction that we have to do with the family wise rate. And if you do the numbers, you will see, okay, and it's explained right here in the same, the same way. When you do this, uh, you get uh, from the, from the 0 0.05, original 0 0.05, and the sample is five, right? You know, five different uh, you know, the, the different ana analysis, you get, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 0 0.05 divided by five, you get 0 0.01, uh, corrected uh, family-wise error rate. So now, instead of rejecting uh, the null hypothesis for number three, that number three is within uh, greater than the threshold. And the only one that you, you should be rejecting is the first manager, okay? So instead of rejecting, you know, the hypothesis for two managers, now it's only one. Now, just to, you know, finish this, because basically that's, that's the time that, that we have. There is a lot of contro controversy, you know, with this method, okay, with the Bonferroni method. And one of the critics of, the, of this correction, this method, is that it's too stringent. In other words, you could be, you could be no rejecting, no hypothesis when you should. That's you know in 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 the statistical community, that's the most uh, uh, critic critic of this uh, of this method. But there's another method, what is called the Holmes, right? The Holmes a step down procedure. And in the Holmes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to post in the uh, in the chat, okay? In the chat, let me see if I can find it. Uh, so the Bonferroni controls more type one that than type two errors. Then is that what you meant? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. You you are controlling really the type one here. Yes. Okay. That, that's true. That's true. Okay. Um. Let me see. Uh, there was a the family wise. Okay. There, there was a there was a, a video that explained very clearly how to. Uh, how to do the homes uh, correction. Okay, let me see if I can find it. Uh, uh. Let me copy the link here. Okay, this is one of them. This is explains the Bonferroni uh, correction. Um, let me see. Okay, and in in the in the uh, the problem the problem with the Bonferroni, as, as I said, is that it's uh, it's too stringent. You know, it, it lowers so much the the original alpha. You know, to get a corrected uh, family-wise rate, that maybe 
there will be instances where the the statistic will tell you not to reject when in fact you should reject and then you know you fall then into the 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 the, the type type to where okay uh this is the the homes you know the set down procedure and what it does is that when you compute those values remember that the fund manager when you compute those values you order them so you're going to order this table right you're going to order this table by the p values so it's going to be the first is going to be the manager number one manager number three right uh four uh five and then two and you're going to use in the formula, you are going to use the ranking, the position of each of the of the sample of, of, of the analysis. You're going to use that ranking to do that correction. And what happens is that sometimes you get the same, the same results at the Pomferroni, but this is a, a a more preferred method to do the correction than the Pomferroni uh, one that I explained. Okay. And there's also other methods. Uh, the authors don't go very in detail, but there's other methods from Tuki and from chefs uh, to do the same, you know, the, the same analysis. Um, one of the things that I, you know, in the in, in the in the videos, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to post a, a later in the in the in the in the channel, is that uh, sometimes you shouldn't do this correction at all. What you should do is just explain what is the what is the caveats of your investigation, and uh, say that there's a possibility that the conclusions that you have attained could vary. All right, and I think that's a more sensible uh, way of, of putting it because sometimes you have to you know uh, let other people reproduce or replicate your analysis and also you know uh, enrich uh, your your conclusions. Sometimes, you know, they're not going to agree on, on, on all of them, but they could agree on part, they could disagree on some. So in general, uh, this is basically, you know, what, what I had. Also, there's another thing called the, uh, the you know, the, the, the false uh, discovery rate, which is more geared to the type two uh, error in terms of the false, you know, uh, the, 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 the false negatives that we see that is associated with the type two error. And it's also based on formula and based on, you know, trying to correct that original alpha that we're using to, you know, uh, decide, uh, you know, if we want to uh, reject the null hypothesis or uh, not reject it, okay? So that's basically what I have, uh, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Thank 